Lord, again, I thank you for this day. I thank you for everything that you have given us. The blessing, of especially of this church family, who comes together not only in person, but for those who are at their various places watching through the technology. I pray for them as well. Lord, I pray today uh, that you would spread your net wide. And as this word goes out, Lord, that you would touch every single heart that hears it. Lord, that I ask you make me smaller, that you might become bigger. Touch the lives and the hearts. Fulfill your promise. Oh, Lord God, that your word does not return to you empty. And let these words not be mine, but yours. With that, I ask you, let me not speak a word more, a word less. And I ask it because you are a rock, and you are a one true redeemer. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, grace and peace be to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from Jesus Christ, our risen and eternal Savior. Well, good morning again. It is good to be in God's house, especially after a week away. Um, my friends, Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, whichever Sunday or whichever name you prefer to go by with it, um, it was only, what, about two Sundays ago that we, we celebrated our, resurrection, our resurrected Savior. And on that day, we remembered the fact that we received a promise two weeks ago, didn't we? And within that promise, it was a promise that was won through the very power of Christ himself. Christ who overcame, who gave us this promise, was a promise of salvation, that because of Jesus' power, defeating sin, death, and the devil, that for those who put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and their one true Savior, that they have the promise and power of life everlasting. Amen? Good, we are on the same page then. And yet, as I say all that, I have a question to ask. As we go along in our calendar, as, church, as Easter goes more and more in our rearview mirrors, does the promise that we received go away? No. That's because God's work is not based on our timeline. God's work is not based on on what we do or what we don't do. God's work is not based on how the world works, what the world is doing. The world cannot diminish the power of God in any way or shape or form or thing that we do or don't do. And I want you to keep that in mind as we go through God's word today, as we look at two of God's servants. And we're going to be looking at both Saul as well as Peter. But in our reading today from Acts chapter 9, we are introduced to a man by the name of Saul. Now Saul Saul's going to get a different name later on in Scripture. We know that we probably most of us know Saul by his other name, which is Paul. And Paul is a huge figure in, in all of Scripture because Paul wrote a huge portion of Scripture. He wrote the majority of the letters that are in Scripture. And yet, as we talk about Saul who later will become Paul, this isn't the first time that he has popped up in the book of Acts, is it? See, Saul, we first meet him back in towards the end of Acts chapter 7. And Saul, he is a witness to a stoning that is about to happen, the stoning of Stephen. And Stephen was a um, follower of Jesus, a man who was full of, of power and grace through Christ And yet the Jewish authority wanted to get rid of Stephen because he was spreading the word of God throughout the area. And yet what it turns out is they decide to stone Stephen on trumped up charges. And when we come to Acts chapter 7 verse 58, we read that the people who were there to stone Stephen, that they were laying their garments down at Stephen's feet. Now, this is a weird thing that they're doing because this is not the way that stoning, according to the Mishnah, which is a part of the Jewish doctrine, rules, and tradition, according to the Mishnah, you would strip the person who was about to be stoned. Except the people who want to stone Stephen want to make their evil act easier on themselves. They want to free up their throwing arms. 
And so they take off those outer garments and they lay them down at Saul's feet. And Saul is approving of this. He doesn't participate in the stoning, but he lay, he's very approving in what's going on. And yet, it seems that this is probably what starts Saul off on his crusade against the church, to wipe them out. Because we'll read later in Acts chapter 8 how that he goes to the, the Jewish authority asking for letters to go and pursue after them. And then we come to Acts chapter 9. And in many of your Bibles, Acts chapter 9 is referred to as the, the conversion of Saul. And this is a huge deal. Because Saul, soon to become Paul, again, who is the author of a huge percentage of the New Testament letters. But what's so compelling about this account is the fact that Saul slash Paul, who prior to this chapter really had been committing truly evil acts against God himself. And essentially... This is Paul's testimony. This is his testimony as about his conversion. The power, the power of God truly can save anyone. That when God works in and through people, he truly can change people's hearts. Now, in many Lutherans, we don't care for testimonies. Testimonies can make us uncomfortable. And I think it's probably two, there's a lot of reasons, but there's probably two main ones. One being that it's not part of our tradition. But the other part, if you've ever been around people who give, have given testimonies before, unfortunately, a lot of time those people make the focus about themselves, thus giving glory to themselves versus giving glory to God. And yet I tell you that testimonies, when it's about God working in and through you, are a good thing it's because your your story matters because when you put the glory on God as we see we'll see what happens here with Saul soon to become Paul it tells people how God can and does work in people in mighty ways and this is huge to remember but let's dig into the text so starting at verse 1 Acts chapter 9 we read but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. This is essentially a dead or alive type of situation. He wants to wipe them out. Notice he says that Saul was breathing, notice that word, breathing threats of murder threats and murder. Some texts, well, some translators will translate he, that he was breathing in. Some texts translate as he was breathing out. And yet breathing for us is an important part of life. That is how we are alive. If we don't, if we're not breathing, we're dead. Saul, however, what he's breathing, regardless of whether it's in or out, are threats and murder. This is the focus of what Saul was breathing. This is the focus of his life. I'm sure if you were to ask him at that point in time, that he would say that what he was doing, that they were actually acts of righteousness. He, there were righteous acts, good acts, and he's effectively trying to destroy the Christian church. And yet, do, do his feelings about what he's doing make it right how he feels about something does it make it right God bless you see unfortunately in our world we think that feelings are the most important part we think that it's important that you feel well about it that you feel good about something that goes contrary to what God tells us, though, doesn't it? Just because it feels good at the moment doesn't make it good, right, and salutary. I've known many drug addicts who will tell you that when they're in the midst of getting high, man, it feels good. And when you, when you come down, that's when it sucks. That's when the pain comes. Or when they're jonesing for it, 
That's when it hurts. Just because it feels good doesn't make it right. And sadly, a lot of people feel this way too about the way they relate their faith to other people. Let me go abuse this person because they don't believe the way I do. Look at the way that some other religions go out there. Look at some way people in some of the churches go out there and try and, and share their faith. The way we do it makes a difference. And let me say this. While feelings change, the truth never changes. Let me say that again. Feelings change, but the truth never, never changes. Saul so desperately wanted to purify his faith that he was willing to do it at any cost. At in, literally any cost. Even at the expense of other people's lives. He was saying, wipe them out, all of them. And unfortunately, we have seen that it's not so different in our modern age when it comes to politics, when it comes to social issues. There are so many more people out there who are willing to destroy people's lives emotionally, socially, and yes, even sometimes physically if you don't agree with what they say. They will claim that they are doing it all in the greater good. And yes, sadly, some of that has come into the church too. And with some of us we cheer it on. Some of us participate in it. All in the name of the moral high ground. And I'd love to see where those people think God is sitting on that moral high ground. Because if it doesn't line up with God's word, it isn't the high ground. God's word is truth and it never changes. Now if we get, go, continue on the text, we go to verse 3. We hear, now as he went on his way, this being Saul, he appeared in, at, he, as, sorry, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. And suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling on the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, I, we need to point out a couple of things there. We need to note the fact that it actually is daylight when this happens. Uh, some people will say, oh, well, it's actually nighttime. I'm, and I say to them, no, it wasn't nighttime. My camel was not driving with his high beams on. This is daylight. Uh, the, the, when this happened, this light comes from heaven and shines it. And it's so intense, it knocks Saul to the ground. And notice something else. We hear the word of God here. The voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And some people put Saul's response in different ways. I think that we sometimes don't notice it. Saul responds, who are you, Lord? A lot of text translates Lord with a lowercase l. Uh, if that doesn't make sense, uh, just so we're clear on that, often when we talk about God, we will put his other names with capital letters, like capital L for Lord. Um, but here... Thing, when Paul falls to the ground, he's not acknowledging who's speaking to him here. He doesn't realize that this is Jesus speaking to him. That's why he asks, Who are you, Lord? Saul doesn't acknowledge who, the authority of it. And Jesus responds this way He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, Saul would have known about Jesus. He probably had heard some of the accounts about Jesus. It's, it's vaguely possible he may have even seen Jesus. But he also wouldn't have believed in Jesus. And he wouldn't have believed in the resurrection of Jesus. And so he certainly also wouldn't have believed in the power of Jesus. And so it was at this point when God says to him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. I'm, I'm certain when Paul or Saul heard these words, 
he needed to go change his shorts. Because not only is the person who we thought to be dead now speaking to him, but Jesus is saying, essentially saying to him, if you come after one of my kids, you're coming after me. That's the scary thought. If you come after one of my kids, you're coming after me. And that's not an arena that anybody is qualified to enter. Nobody is qualified to take on God. And yet as I say this, when Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, not only does he mean you are mocked, that we are his children, he actually also means it literally. See, we're going to partake in a meal in a little bit here. And you know, the fancy plates and silverware, the decorations don't make it what's special. What's special is that God actually comes and becomes a part of that. And so when we take communion, what are we taking within ourselves? Christ's body and blood. And so if Christ's body and blood are within you, Christ is actually a part of you. Think about that. So in John, always Jesus is saying, when you come after my kids, you're coming after me. He's also saying, literally, you're coming after me. God is a part of you when we take communion. The very body and blood of Christ is in us and a part of us. And yet there's something missing about the account here. Saul slash Paul fills in this gap here when we jump forward into Acts chapter 26. And I think I've missed it so many times in the past. Now, Acts chapter 26 is when Paul is in front of King Agrippa at this point. And he's giving, he's recounting the tale of how he had this conversion. And when he gets to the point where, where God tells him, where Jesus says, who I am, he tells us, he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Okay, it's the same. And then it says, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. I've read over that so many times and never give it a second thought. Now, my friends, I believe that God pursues each and every one of us. And that God also uses various techniques to reach us as well. Sometimes he is gentle, and we, it's, we respond in kind. But other times, and we have to all admit it, there are times that we don't want to listen. We're all guilty of it, whether we want to admit it. And sometimes he has to take a more forceful approach. And that's the goad that God's talking about here. See, a goad was this long rod that the farmers would use to control the cattle. Sometimes the cattle didn't want to listen. So at the end of this rod, sometimes they had sharpened it to a tip. Other times they put a sharp metal tip on it. And so when the cattle didn't listen, sometimes they got hit with that tip. Other times they actually jabbed the cattle with that tip. And the cattle would try and kick at it to get it away from them. And so that is what God was saying here. Saul, sometimes it's hard to kick against the goads, isn't it? And so sometimes it hurts when we don't want to listen to him. Our choice to not listen to God sometimes hurts. And yet God loves you too much to not try and get your attention. God, let me say that again, God loves you too much to not try something to get your attention. I think I've shared it with you before. I've known personally some people who have gone to jail and some of those people have thanked God that he did this. That he said, I would have never stopped what it was that I was doing until God did this to get my attention. They actually thanked God for being put in prison. 
See, ultimately, you can choose to go your own way. All like sheep, we have gone astray, right? It's no wonder God compares this to sheep, because sheep are pretty stubborn. I think we're pretty stubborn, too, sometimes, too. Even though, again, sometimes we don't want to admit just how stubborn we are. And yet God loves you too much to not try and reach you. Because for God, Jesus' death and his resurrection isn't so much about this life here. See, this life here, as opposed to, as opposed to the next, here is eternal. Here, this is time-bound. There is an ending to it. And yet, what comes after it? That's eternal. And where you go at that point is where you stay. God is worried about that. And so that's why he says, Saul, sometimes it's hard to, to kick against that goad. I love you so much that I am pursuing you. And it's this that kind of kicks off Saul's conversion, where he really starts to listen to God's word. And I mean, it goes on uh, Acts nine six. But rise and enter the city. <clears throat> Excuse me. You will be told what what you are to do. And the men were traveling with him. They stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose to the ground, and his eyes were open. He saw nothing. And so they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And for three days he was without sight. Um, this kicks off Saul's conversion, his dramatic conversion. Saul, who is a man who by all intents and purposes did not deserve God's love because he was trying to murder God's people to try and end God's reign by any means necessary. But we also need to look at somebody else today too. And as I said earlier, that person is Peter. Now, if you remember, uh, this, te- this part from our gospel lesson comes from the, the last chapter in uh, St. John's account. Jesus has already risen from the dead. The disciples had already seen Jesus risen from the dead. They'd seen his wounds, his pierced sides, pierced hands and feet. And yet, as I read this text... I don't know if you get the same reaction. When I read it, it seems to have a real somber note. Because we get to verse 3, and Peter just gets up, and he says, I'm going fishing. And the disciples are with him. Hey, we'll go too. You think if they saw Christ, they'd all be jumping up and down for the next five months. And yet Peter says, I'm going fishing. And it's the middle of the night, and the disciples all say, hey, we're going to go with you. And they get out there, they get in the boat, they get out in the water. And Jesus shows up on the shore, except they don't know who it is. They just think he's some sort of rando guy who just kind of showed up. And Jesus shouts out, have you had any luck today? And the guys, it's still the middle night, said, no, Jesus. Or, no, sorry, they don't know it's Jesus yet. He said, no, no luck. Hasn't been so great. And Jesus tells them, why don't you try the other side of the boat? And they throw the net into the water, and immediately the net gets filled with water. Or filled, sorry, filled with fish. And all of a sudden, one of the disciples gets it. Peter, that's Jesus. Peter, do you get it? That's Jesus out there. Peter is so stoked. He jumps out of the boat, uh, grabs his garments. He's oh, trying to swim ashore. It seems like the boat and Peter get to the shore about the same time. And when they get to the shore, Jesus has already kind of made breakfast. And they, um, they, and Jesus says, why don't you bring some of the fish? We'll add it to the breakfast meal. And they bring the fish. Uh, they tell us that the number was 153 fish that they had there. Remember that number. Um, and after the meal, and we're going to go a little bit farther than our text went for today, Jesus and Peter go and have a heart to heart. And Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Jesus, Peter says, Jesus, you know I love you. I love you so much. Jesus says, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Jesus, you absolutely know how much I love you. Peter, tend my sheep. Peter, 
do you love me? And it's at this point, I can about hear those heartstrings and Peter just breaking. Because Peter's thinking about what he did. He said, Jesus, I will never abandon you. I will never forsake you. Man, I don't care what comes to this world. I will never go up against you. And then Jesus, Jesus' prediction happens. When the, the rooster crows, Peter had already denied Jesus. And then Jesus goes off into the cross. And so this was weighing on Peter's mind. And Peter says, Jesus, you know I love you. You know everything about me. You know my, the eternity of my life. You know that I love you. And Jesus simply says, Peter, feed my sheep. I, see, I see this whole section about Jesus restoring Peter. Because, again, it's not just about the de denial. It's not just that those three times. Think about when, he was, when Peter was first called. Jesus came to give a sermon to the great crowds who were there that day. For, and then after he gives this sermon to the crowd, he says, Peter, push out in the boats. And this is before Peter was a disciple. And they push out and he says, put the net in the water. He says, Jesus, I've already did that. We've had no luck fishing. But I'll do it anyway since you asked. And he throws it. And remember, the nets got full to overflow. And they call another boat to get it. And those boats are overflowing with the amount of fish. This is the recalling of what happened. Remember, I won't eat with you until I'm risen. There's Jesus. Ghosts don't eat. That's who it is before him. Three times Jesus says, feed my sheep. Who are the sheep? Everyone. Now remember, I said remember that number with number of fish. Do you remember what the number was? 153. Well, um, but that's an important number important for that time because at that point in time, 153 was supposed to be the known amount of fish in the world. That's the known amount of types of fish. And so what Jesus is saying, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. You know what the most important, most valuable uh, possession that God has is? Y'all. 153. Now I give you this example. I love you all, but the way I love my wife and my kids doesn't compare. Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. I'm going to trust you with my most valuable possession in this world. That's how much I love you, Peter. That's the value I put on you. He's telling Peter, I don't care who it is. Go take care of that person because I love them. See, Jesus came for all y'all. There is no sin that the blood of Christ can't wash you clean of. There is no distance that you can run that he won't follow you to bring you back home. He is the great physician who came to save us from ourselves. And he is the Savior who came to save sinners. And this meal that's prepared for me, behind me here, that meal that's behind, it was prepared for you. It was prepared for people who put their faith and their trust in God. That you might receive a meal as the promise of forgiveness of sins, a promise of life everlasting. And I think in many ways, many of us are, are Saul's or we're Peter's or we know a Saul or we know a Peter. We know somebody who actively was trying to fight against the church or maybe you were trying to do that. You may know somebody who loves Jesus so much and yet they feel like their sins are too great for him to ever forgive. And yet Christ is pursuing you. And Christ is pursuing that person. He loves you too much to not pursue you. That's our God who came to save you.
who came to save those people who don't know him, who came to save the people who think they don't deserve or won't think that God could ever love somebody like them. That's who God came from. That's who God came to save. Our one and eternal God. Through Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is our one true God who loves you too much to not come after you and to try and bring you home. And it's in his most precious name that we pray and say, Amen. Amen.